To the Cherokee, Chickamauga means river of blood. For two days in October of 1863, the Chickamauga more than lived up to its name. For the men who survived, Chickamauga would be remembered as one gigantic brawl, bushwhacking on a huge scale in the vortex of hell. It was the great Western engagement of the Civil War, the Battle of Chickamauga, next on Civil War combat. Northwest Bank and Trust, Huntington, Indiana. Spring 1863. Sir. Union Brigade Commander John Wilder had waited long enough. For months, his requisition for the new seven-shot Spencer rifles for his brigade had been held up in Washington. With the summer campaign in the West about to begin, Wilder decided to take matters into his own hands. Pledging his own fortune and good name, Wilder asked for a loan from a group of bankers back home in Indiana in order to purchase the unusual and powerful weapons himself. Wilder envisioned his brigade fighting in a new way, mounted with each man carrying the firepower of seven. Being a magazine-fed arm and firing a rimfire copper cased cartridge, it allowed the soldier to Ready. fire effectively three to four Eight. times the number of rounds in a minute that the soldier armed with the standard three-band muzzle-loading rifle could fire. Our men adore them as the heathen do their idols, one soldier wrote. With his men rearmed, Wilder expected them to be a continuous source of irritation to the Confederates. Well to the south in Mississippi, another brigade was also unhappy with the support it was getting. Hailing from Kentucky, the brigade was the largest border state unit in the Confederate Army, and the men were completely cut off from home. Brigade member Johnny Green's situation was typical. While other men received state-issued clothing and personal packages from home, Green and his comrades received nothing but what the Confederate government could spare. It's hard, very hard for them to be able to have any contact from home. In most cases, no contact at all. So for the entire length of the war, they are not aware of what's going on at home with their families. Like the border state they came from, the Kentucky Brigade was a wild mixture of frontier America. Among them were Mohawk Indians, backwoods hunters, hard scrabble farmers, even President Abraham Lincoln's brother-in-law. From their dwindling numbers and homeless condition, they had earned a nickname from their comrades, the Orphan Brigade. In the summer of 1863, the Kentuckians were also orphaned from their own army. Originally assigned to Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee, the unit was sent south to Vicksburg in an effort to save that city. With the fall of Vicksburg, everyone knew the next goal for the Federals would be Chattanooga, and Bragg would need every man he could get to hold it. Bragg was a very good logistician, very good disciplinarian, and a good strategist. But when things started going the wrong way, other things develop, he finds it very hard to change his plans to go with the flow of what's going on. Captain. That strength of tie, that unity that should exist between an army commander and his subordinates was always lacking for Braxton Bragg. Unfortunately, because Bragg's men were good soldiers and his officers' corps were, were good men, but that leadership, that leadership component always seems to be weak in these Western Confederate armies. George. Confronting Bragg's army was the Union Army of the Cumberland. To Army Commander William Rosecrans, the goal was simple. Pry the Confederates off the Cumberland Plateau, 
force a battle on the open ground beyond, and capture Chattanooga, a vital southern rail hub and the key to the Union advance on Atlanta. In the fall of 1862 and the spring of 1863, William Stark Rosecrans was one of the most successful of the Union Army level commanders at that time. His success in Western Virginia in the summer and fall of 1861, his operations in Western Tennessee in the summer and fall of 1862. William Stark Rosecrans' star was on the ascendance in the spring of 1863. North of the Cumberland Plateau, soldiers in Rosecrans' army packed up for the campaign. Among them, Union Private Ben Mabry of the 82nd Indiana. He's gonna sit around a campfire in the evening, open up his haversack, and soldiers would reread those letters from home. They were so essential and so important, and they would reread them over and over and over until they'd become dog-eared and smudged with dirt. Among Mabry's personal items were treasured pictures of his young family, as well as paper, ink, and envelopes with which to write home. In the coming campaign, he would guard his knapsack as carefully as he did his rifle and his life. Rosecrans fully expected it would take him more than a month to force the Cumberland Plateau and cost as many as 10,000 men. To avoid high casualties, he designed a complicated strategy to outmaneuver the Confederates. Directly in front of the advancing Federals was Hoover's Gap, the goal of John Wilder's mounted riflemen. By the time that the active phase of the campaign for Chattanooga begins in late June, Wilder's men are very confident in their ability. They have perfected their use of the animals for transportation, and they have um, used their Spencers enough to know what their capabilities are. Wilder was soon in possession of all of Hoover's Gap. But he was well out in front of the rest of the army, completely isolated. When the Confederates counterattacked, Wilder was barely able to hold on to what he won. Fearing that Wilder would be cut off and captured, Division Commander Reynolds sent his adjutant, Captain Rice, to order Wilder back or face arrest. Wilder would have none of it. I declined to obey the order of arrest and requested Captain Rice to return to General Reynolds and tell him we had driven their force back and could not be driven by any forces that would come up against us. Colonel John T. Wilder. Despite pressure from the Confederates in his front and the threat of arrest from the rear, Wilder held on to Hoover's Gap. Following the battle, Rosecrans believed the action saved the army a thousand men and a week of hard campaigning. He praised Wilder and gave his unit a new name, the Lightning Brigade. With the Southern defeats at Gettysburg and Vicksburg in July of 1863, the attention of both sides turned to the effort to seize Chattanooga. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton prodded William Rosecrans to get moving. Lee's army overthrown, Grant victorious. You and your noble army now have the chance to deliver the finishing blow to the rebellion. Will you miss the chance? Rosecrans was quick to defend both himself and his army. You do, not seem to you do not appear to observe the fact that this noble army has driven the rebels from all of Middle Tennessee. I beg that the War Department may not overlook so great an event because it is not written in letters of blood. W.S. Rosecrans. Continuing his game of grand strategy, Rosecrans forced Bragg to retreat again, and the Federals crossed the Tennessee River and took the prize of the campaign. With Chattanooga in our hands, I think the rebellion must dwindle and die, Lincoln had said. Now, with Chattanooga added to the list of Southern setbacks, the Confederates responded. 
A division of 7,000 men was sent to Bragg from Knoxville. Two more divisions came from the west, including the Kentucky Orphan Brigade. And still more men were coming, two divisions from Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. In all, nearly 30,000 men were added to the Army of Tennessee. The reinforcements basically turned the tables on the Federal Army. Here they are outnumbering the Confederates in the first part of the campaign, but with these arrivals to the Army, the situation is now turned around, Bragg having the numbers in his favor for once. Compounding the situation for Rosecrans was the scattered condition of his army. Rumors spread that the Confederates were concentrating, but so far there was no evidence. Then John Wilder arrived at the headquarters of Corps Commander George Thomas. He brought with him three dusty, hungry Confederates from units that were new to Bragg's army. The danger was clear. Confederate troops were converging on the area and the distant Union formations must be reunited quickly or risk being engaged separately and destroyed one by one. For two months in the summer of 1863, the Union Army of the Cumberland outflanked and outmaneuvered the Confederate Army of Tennessee. They captured Chattanooga and crossed the Tennessee River. But the long rebel retreat was ending. Heavily reinforced, the Confederates turned now to meet the enemy near Chickamauga Creek in northwestern Georgia. As he marched north with the rest of the 9th Kentucky, Sergeant Johnny Green was feeling upbeat. They've been as far away as Mississippi, and now they're halfway home. They can almost taste, they can almost feel, they can almost sense a homecoming. Uh, to march through Tennessee, cross over into Kentucky, and see family once again. In another gray division, Private William Oliphant was pleased just to be turning around. For two months, his Texas regiment had been retreating. Now it was clear that Confederate General Braxton Bragg had decided to make a fight and Oliphant was sure his unit would be in the thick of it. Confidence surged throughout the army, from the privates all the way up through the commanding officer. Soldiers, you are largely reinforced. You must now seek the contest. Our cause is in your keeping. Your enemy boasts that you are demoralized and retreating before him. Failure is impossible and victory must be ours. Braxton Bragg, General Commanding, Army of Tennessee. What Bragg wanted to do was to get his army in between the Union Army and Chattanooga, and then attack the Union left flank and drive the Union Army south and southwestward and crush them against the mountains to the south and west. Bragg had one day, September 18th, to accomplish his goal, destroy the Union Army before it could be brought together. Complicating things for the Confederates was Chickamauga Creek. There, small Union details took positions at the bridges and forts and held up the Confederates until it was nearly dark. Gaining those crossings was not without the loss of some life and most importantly, time. That resistance by the Federals meant that by the end of September the 18th, Bragg's troops had only begun to get to the west side of Chickamauga Creek. It had tipped off to Rosecrans that Bragg was trying to cut him off from Chattanooga. Bragg had lost his chance to defeat the Federal Army in detail. West of the Confederates, Union General William Rosecrans hurried to reunite his scattered forces. As units found their place in line, they went into camp. Battle was imminent. There had been a lot of skirmishing, there had been a lot of maneuvering in the previous weeks. They know that uh, the Confederates are out there, you can almost smell them in the air. Near the center of the new Union line, 
Colonel Hans Christian Haig took a moment to write to his wife. Haig was Norwegian, but moved as a young man to Wisconsin. He had seen his regiment decimated from 1,000 men to 176, but felt confident his own luck would hold. The rebels are in our front, and we may have to fight a battle. If we do, it will have to be a big one. Do not be uneasy for me. I am well and in good spirit, and trusting to my usual good luck. My love to the children. Goodbye, my darling. Your own, Hans. Even though the Union Army was now concentrated, Bragg's plan for September 19th remained unchanged. He continued to move his forces to the north, looking for a way to get around the Federal left. Rosecrans countered by moving Union General George Thomas's 14th Corps up the Lafayette Road to block him. Both sides were expecting a fight, and any sudden contact would touch it off. With two of his divisions at hand, and more on the way, Thomas moved cautiously forward and ran headlong into dismounted cavalry under Confederate Brigadier General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so this encounter was a surprise to Braxton Bragg, and he did not fully understand and appreciate that it indicated that the Union left flank had been moved overnight three to four miles further to the north. The Federals drove Forrest's skirmishers back. But the Confederates countered with a division under Brigadier General State's rights gist. Thomas then sent in additional men to try to stabilize the situation. One of these men was Private Mabry of the 82nd Indiana. He and his comrades hurled themselves at Gist's Confederates. Mabry's fight was representative of all the action during the long, hot afternoon of September 19th. At first, the Yankees pushed back the enemy and got them running. Then the attack stalled, the men exhausted. A new enemy formation was fed into the battle, right on the Union flank. And then it was the Federals' turn to run. And you get great emotional swings, where first, the soldiers can experience the elation of success in driving the enemy. And all of a sudden, that might rapidly change to despair when an enemy force appears from an unexpected direction or an enemy force of much greater size appears and drives them back. One Union brigadier compared the combat to a vicious brawl, a mad, irregular battle very much resembling guerrilla warfare on a grand scale, in which one army was bushwhacking the other. With both sides rushing units to the front, the Battle of Chickamauga would soon become one of the bloodiest conflicts of the Civil War. During the morning of September 19th, 1863, the Confederate Army of Tennessee and the Union Army of the Cumberland stumbled into each other along Chickamauga Creek in northwestern Georgia. Both sides were rushing new units to the field, and as soon as they arrived, they were fed into the conflict. The nature of the fighting is extremely brutal at Chickamauga. The woods are very open, but to an extent, once the first shots are fired, the woods fill with smoke. In some cases in the battle, units literally walk into each other and the fighting breaks out at point blank range. In the counterattack, the feelings of my gracious, what do we do? Where's our command? Where's our captain? Uh, where are the colors? Where's the regimental formation? Uh, where does our brigade go at this point as, as you swing back and forth in the battle? With his plans for trapping the Federals completely wrecked, Confederate Commander Braxton Bragg improvised, sending in his divisions one at a time. 
but each was repulsed in turn. With the battle now completely out of Bragg's control, his commanders were acting on their own without waiting for orders. On the Confederate left, General John Bell Hood was impatient, waiting for the order to advance. Hood was very aggressive and made his career by attacking, and here he's having to sit it out, hearing the roar of the guns all around him. Hood and his men had come nearly a thousand miles from Virginia to get into a fight, so they went looking for one. Facing Hood were Hans Hegg's Wisconsin, Ohio, and Kansas regiments. Hood's men attacked with all the spirit they had ever shown in Virginia. Hans Hegg's brigade fell apart. His own regiment, the 15th Wisconsin, came out of the fighting with only 56 men, 120 fewer than when they started. Among the mortally wounded was Colonel Hegg. Bleeding and reeling in the saddle, Hegg tried to rally his panicked men to no avail. But once again, the attackers ran out of steam, and into the breach rode John Wilder's brigade. With the help of an Indiana battery, the Spencer riflemen poured a deadly and rapid fire into Hood's men. It seemed a pity to kill men so. I had it in my heart to order the fire to cease, to end the awful sight. Colonel John T. Wilder. Again, the Union line was patched up, and the Federals still held the road. As the sun began to set, the fighting also died away. But one officer wanted his men prepared for more fighting before nightfall. As he rode along his lines, Union General George Thomas told them, they may come again, be ready. At the Chickamauga River, across from Thomas's line, was Confederate General Patrick Claiborne's division. Among Claiborne's 13 regiments was William Oliphant's 6th Texas. Late in the afternoon, the bugle sounded, and we were immediately called to attention. Then came the sharp commands, right face, forward, march. Away we went, dashing into the Chickamauga Creek, waist deep. Just at dusk, we broke the Federal line and drove the enemy back in confusion. Bowing our heads and grasping our guns, we plunged into the vortex of hell. Private William Oliphant. In the darkness, the chaos is unbelievable. Men being shot by their own troops, several officers wandering out in front of their men and being made prisoner or killed by their own side. Very confusing and very chaotic. As with the other attacks that day, Claiborne's assault was unsupported. The Confederates fell back to regroup, and Union troops were moved in to fill the gap, and the Union line held on. Really at no point on September the 19th did Bragg come close to achieving his objective of interposing his army uh, in between the Union Army and Chattanooga. While officers in both armies worked through the night to put their units back together, the commanders met to discuss tactics for the next day. William Rosecrans' officers believed they should stay where they were and fight it out. Before falling asleep in a corner, George Thomas told his commander, I would strengthen the left, and Rosecrans agreed. Braxton Bragg would reorganize his forces but his basic plan would be unchanged, an attack on the Union left in order to drive the Federals away from Chattanooga. The night was cold, and on the field, many men lay awake all night, thinking about what they'd been through and preparing themselves for the next day. 
Sleep seemed to have gone from our eyes, slumber from our eyelids as we lay there, our faces turned up toward the heavens. Many, many a soldier asked himself the question, what is this all about? Why is it that 120,000 men of one blood and one tongue, believing as one man in the fatherhood of God, should in the blaze of civilization in this 19th century be thus armed with all the improved appliances of modern warfare and seeking each other's lives? Lieutenant Robert Collins, 15th Texas. After only one day of combat, the Battle of Chickamauga had claimed more casualties than the Battle at Pea Ridge, or Champion Hill, or the first day of Shiloh. The fighting had been confused and vicious, with each side surprising and slaughtering the other in the woods and small fields along the Chickamauga River. But now both armies were concentrated and ready for a more organized engagement. Knowing they would again be on the defensive, Union troops began building crude breastworks. The men began to pile up limbs and logs and branches, rock, sticks, stones, stumps, and fence rails to create crude field fortifications, something that many of them call log works or log barricades. September 20th was Sunday, the first day of autumn, and the final day on Earth for many of the men sleeping amid the carnage along the Chickamauga. Just as they did two days before, the Confederates got off to a late start. General Braxton Bragg's attack, which was supposed to step off at dawn, did not begin until 9.30. Once again, the Confederates sent in their divisions one at a time, and the Federals, secure behind their new earthworks, cut them down in droves. The enemy to our left poured their fire into us as did those in front. We were within 30 yards of the enemy breastworks, giving and taking death blows which could last but a few minutes without utter annihilation. Sergeant Johnny Green, Kentucky Orphan Brigade. A Confederate brigade eventually broke through on the far left. Federal Private Benjamin Mabry's regiment was sent forward to stem the assault. The nature of the hand-to-hand -hand combat and the fighting here is very brutal because you have to be willing to kill a man looking into his eyes, to stab a man into his stomach with a bayonet or club a man in the head with the butt of your musket. Be very brutal. Pick up a canteen, pick up a rock, smash somebody with it. The Confederate attacks were beaten back, and the two sides took up the simple but deadly task of shooting each other at close range. George Thomas's Union line ran in a long arc, protecting the Lafayette Road, the Army's direct link to Chattanooga and safety. Coming at them was Patrick Claiborne's division, the same troops who waded the Chickamauga at dusk and fought the Federals by the light of burning trees and fences. Now, in broad daylight, they attacked head on. William Oliphant took one mini ball and then another. There is something that's remarkable about the man who would stay, and a man who receives a serious wound to the arm, to the leg, uh, maybe a wound to the neck or the head, and yet he won't leave. He is so resolute. I will stay here. I will die if necessary. I don't want to die, but if I die, this is as good a place as any. Oliphant took a third bullet, this time in the jaw. Stunned and bleeding in three places, he turned away from one scene of horror and walked into another. The hospital consisted of a few brush arbors and a large quantity of straw spread on the ground. Hundreds of blood-covered men were lying there. Many of the wounded were groaning, 
A few were crying out in their agony, while others were quietly dying. To me, the place was horrible, even more so than the battlefield itself, for the enthusiasm and excitement of the battle were missing. Only hundreds of blood-covered men, and the numbers increasing as the ambulances and litter bearers arrived from the battlefield. William Oliphant. For two hours, Bragg's legions had hammered away at Thomas's line. Bragg's right hand blow had been wrecked. Now came the time to attack on the left. Word that a gap may exist in his center prompted Rosecrans to move a division under Thomas Wood further to the left. Where no gap existed, one was now created. Poised to strike in this area was Longstreet's wing of Braxton Bragg's army. By pure dumb luck, that gap where Wood's division pulls out of line is directly opposite where the Confederates have what turned out to be their power punch on the battlefield. They're willing to go in and face the odds as they had in Virginia. After all, many of them have the attitude that they are here to show these army of Tennessee men, these Western men, how to fight. As it turned out, William Stark Rosecrans had the best seat in the house for the disaster that was about to befall his army. This is not something that he has planned on. A commanding general doesn't plan to, to retreat, especially one that has been as victorious as he has. The Union line had been broken many times in the previous two days, but this time was different. Major units were fleeing from the field, and there was no one for Rosecrans to call on to fill the hole. Now, the only thing standing in the way of total victory for the Confederates was George Thomas's corps on the Union left. To meet this new threat, Thomas extended his line to the west, fortifying the high grounds of Horseshoe Ridge and Snodgrass Hill. From this vantage point, they could shoot down upon the onrushing Confederates. As Joe Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade advanced through these woods on the edge of Snodgrass Hill, they don't really know what's ahead of them, but they feel that they can overtake anything that would be there. As they get into this open ground, they're greeted with a rude surprise, though. Blast of canister from these Napoleon guns and rifle fire from Harker's infantry. There was an open spur on which Harker's brigade wound up. And Harker used the reverse slope of that open spur as his primary position, and then advanced one regiment at a time to the crest to just the point where they could see down the slope in their front towards the Confederate, where they would deliver a volley and then withdraw to that crest and back to the back slope to reload while another regiment repeated the same process. While Longstreet's men were attacking Thomas's right, Johnny Green and the orphaned Kentuckians were attacking Thomas's original line, the arc in front of the road, and the result was the same. We rushed against the enemy, but his batteries had full play on us. Their several lines of infantry poured volley after volley into us. The very air was full of shot and shell. Here flying cloud, the Mohawk Indian was fatally shot in the forehead. And Jim Hunter, the wit of the regiment, and Dick Taylor, and John Fightmaster, and Nat Hedger, and many others, all killed right on top of the enemy's breastworks. Johnny Green, Kentucky off from the gate. What the Confederates lacked in the way of tactics, they made up for in determination. George Thomas was running out of ammunition, men, and water. Through it all, Thomas remained calm, moving small units to plug the gaps and correcting his alignment when he could not retake a position. Rosecrans' chief of staff, future President James Garfield, was impressed and dubbed him the Rock of Chickamauga. But unless help arrived, the rock would crumble. 
Some help came in the form of Wilder's mounted riflemen, who arrived on the field where they were needed most, and in the nick of time. Here they were, armed with their repeating rifles. They met us with such a terrific fire that we were compelled to fall back over the brow of a hill for protection. There was a breeze passing through the woods, blowing the yellow leaves from the trees. In my mind, I compared those fallen leaves to the fallen men on that battlefield. John Cox, 2nd South Carolina. Later that afternoon, Thomas's men spotted a sizable column moving down from the north. Were they Union or Confederate? That answer would determine the outcome of George Thomas's fight atop Snodgrass Hill. By late afternoon on September 20th, 1863, Union General George Thomas wondered if things could be any worse. Earlier in the day, half of the Union Army had been defeated and routed from the battlefield at Chickamauga. Thomas's half was holding on, but nearly out of ammunition and faced with an unknown column marching on their rear. But at last, there was good news. Staff officer Ambrose Bierce identified the column as Gordon Granger's reserve corps. 5,000 fresh Yankee soldiers. Just as important was what Granger's men brought with them, 100,000 rounds of reserve ammunition. Thomas recognized that he could not maintain his positions here indefinitely. He essentially had two lines, connected only by a heavy line of skirmishers, and eventually the Confederates may well find one of those flanks of those two lines. And so in late afternoon, George Henry Thomas ordered a phased withdrawal of the troops from the battlefield. The Battle of Chickamauga ended with the Union retreat from the field. Private Ben Mabry had been in action for nearly 48 hours. Happy to be alive, he was saddened by the loss of perhaps his most precious possession. Well, Lou, I must tell you something. The Rebs got my knapsack, my pictures of you and everything. I only got what I have on. But I will make it all right with them yet, for I will take as much from them the first chance I get. To Lou Mabry from Ben Mabry. The battle was a Confederate success, but both sides had mixed emotions. The Confederates were thrilled with the victory, but realized it had come at a fearful cost. There was also the sense that the victory was not as complete as it should have been. There were certainly Confederate officers, uh, one being Nathan Bedford Forrest, who relished the opportunity of, let us pursue these Union troops. We have them on the run. Let's Let's give them the coup de grace. Let's do it now. And that wasn't to be. Uh, so the Federal Army did slip away from the field. With the Federals in full retreat to Chattanooga, the Confederate Army of Tennessee found itself in an unfamiliar situation. They held the field of battle. We saw men cold and stiff in death, and yet holding on to their guns, some with their ramrod yet in their hands. We saw many men who had been stripped of all their clothing and whose pockets had been rifled and turned inside out. We found some of the big logs from behind which the Federals fought, just bristling with ramrods, fired off by our men who were in haste while advancing, loading and firing, and they let the Federals have it, ramrods and all. Lieutenant Robert Collins, 15th Texas Cavalry, dismounted. The Union Army of the Cumberland had lost over 16,000 men, including Colonel Hans Christian Haig, whose body arrived home about the same time as the letter he wrote to his wife the night before the battle. For the Confederates, Chickamauga was a Pyrrhic victory. 18,000 men were killed, wounded, and missing. 
Among the wounded was William Oliphant, who made a remarkable recovery from his three wounds and rejoined his regiment in time for the next battle. Union General William Rosecrans was disgraced by the loss and replaced by George Thomas. A year after Chickamauga, Rosecrans turned down a chance to run as Lincoln's vice president. He went on to a public career that spanned three decades and died in 1898. Johnny Green of the Orphan Brigade survived the war, but only returned to Kentucky when the fighting ended. The Kentucky orphans lost nearly 500 men at Chickamauga, half of their strength. Among those killed was the brigade commander Benjamin Helm, Lincoln's brother-in-law. John Wilder, whose hard-riding, fast-shooting lightning brigade helped keep the Union route at Chickamauga from becoming a complete disaster, settled in Chattanooga after the war, where he later served as mayor and postmaster. He died in 1917. After Chickamauga, Braxton Bragg's subordinates tried to have him replaced. President Davis left Bragg in command, but then relieved him a month later, following the Confederate defeat at Chattanooga. After the war, Bragg worked as an engineer and died in 1876. On November 25th, Private Ben Mabry kept his promise to his wife. In the Union attack on Missionary Ridge outside Chattanooga, Mabry managed to take a knapsack from a fleeing Confederate. It didn't contain the things he lost, but he felt he had evened the score just the same. So did the rest of the Union Army of the Cumberland. Assigned a small diversionary role in Grant's assault on Missionary Ridge, Thomas's men had other ideas. Enraged at being considered losers, Thomas's army took an advanced Confederate position and, against orders, they kept going. Driving them on was their own special cry of battle, a word that will carry them through many bloody fields to come. Chickamauga.